Day 736 in the loop. The harvest begins and all that exists is fear. This is how it goes, every night at the same time. Minutes pass, or maybe hours, it's hard to tell. But at some point I begin to hallucinate. My mind recoils from the pain and the panic and I'm no longer in my cell. I'm standing on the roof of the Black Road Vertical, the mile high tower block where I used to live. The boy with the blonde hair is screaming. He's trying to pull a weapon from his pocket as he steps back towards the edge of the building. And the girl in the witch mask is getting too close. If I don't do something, he'll kill her. Stay back, he screams, his voice cracking in his rage and his dread. One last tug and he frees the pistol from his pocket. He takes another step back, increasing the distance between himself and the girl in the mask. And then he aims the gun at her head. My eyes snap open as the harvest ends, and I'm left completely drained on the hard concrete floor of my tiny gray cell. My heart beats so loud and so fast that I can hear it echoing off the walls of the clear glass tube that surrounds me and reaches from the ceiling to the floor. I try to brace myself for what comes next. I try to hold my breath, but there's no time. The cold water falls from the ceiling so relentlessly and so powerfully that I'm sure I'll suffocate. My lungs are on fire as the tube begins to fill with the chemical laced water. My exhausted body begs me to suck in oxygen, but if I do, I'll drown. After what feels like a hundred years, the grate opens below me and I'm sucked to the floor. The water drains away and I'm left choking and gasping for air. My breaths come out in ragged coughs as I lie naked at the bottom of the tube. The heated air comes next. A blast of constant wind that's so hot it's on the very edge of burning my bare skin. Once I'm dry, the air stops and the tube lifts, disappearing back into the ceiling for another day. And for the longest time, all I can do is lie still on the cold floor. In the loop, this is the closest thing we get to the shower, a government approved waterboarding. What was your favourite childhood book? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I read so many books when I was when I was young, so it's really hard for me to say which one was my favourite. But I think maybe the ones that influenced me the most um, were the Goosebumps books by R.L. Stein. Um, I think I was a little bit young when I started reading them, maybe seven or eight years old. And I think I read them up until I was about 13 or 14. Um, but when I first started reading them, they, they scared me so much. And for some reason, I just kept going back to them. I would read them and I wouldn't be able to sleep at night. And I would tell myself, oh, okay, I'm not going to read that tomorrow. And then for some reason, the next night, I would just want to go back to them and read them again, despite the fact that they really terrified me. Um, really hard to pick one, though, because I, I loved them. I think the, the first one I read was a book called Piano Lessons Can Be Murder. It's all about this boy who um, moved to a new house and uh, he started getting piano lessons because they found this old piano uh, in the house and the piano started playing at night. And uh, yeah, I just remember, I remember it being really scary, but for some reason I just couldn't help going back to it night after night and reading more and being scared. And, and yeah, I think I would have to choose the Goosebumps series of books um, that kind of really inspired me to write the scary scenes in my own books. What inspired you to start writing? Um, what inspired me to start writing? Um, it was my love of reading, really. Um, I remember like my 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 mum reading me books when I was really young, before I could even read, and and just thinking it was amazing that you could disappear into these the other worlds that people had come up with, and just thinking how incredible that would be to to do myself um, and yeah I was always really encouraged by my parents to give things a try um, and yeah I think I, I came up with ideas for stories before I could even write properly um, so yeah I'd have to say my parents and their love of reading which kind of transferred over to me because they would read to me before I could read and then encourage me to read books myself when I was very young so yeah my my kind of desire to write came from my love of reading uh, and that came from my parents. So uh, yeah, sort of a chain of rea reaction of things that led to, that led to it. What was your dream job when you were younger? Oh, that's a good question. What was my dream job when I was younger? Um, <laughs> I, I wanted to be a professional skateboarder for a long time when I was younger. I, wanted, I basically wanted to be uh, Tony Hawk for a little while, I think. Um, yeah, when I was really young, I got a skateboard when I was, again, probably 
around the same time that I was getting into Goosebumps books, I was trying to learn to ride a skateboard. And most of the time I was falling on and just hurting myself. <laughs> again, something for some reason I'd go back to it over and over again, keep trying. Um, it seems to be a theme of my of my life. <laughs> like whether things scared me or whether they hurt me, I would go back to them and, and, and keep trying. So yeah, for a very long time, I wanted to be a professional skateboarder. Um, luckily, I decided that writing was probably a safer uh, career choice in the end. So that's why I went with. Share something your readers wouldn't know about you. Something your readers wouldn't know about me. Um, well, uh, before I got a, um, a book deal, before I, I, I published any books, um, I was actually for almost a year, I lived in a converted shipping container that was about the size of I know your average bathroom, I think, and it was, uh, um, yeah, it was very small uh, and obviously very cheap, and that's why I lived there. So yeah, for for almost a year of my life, I lived in a in a shipping container that I could almost touch both walls at the same time. Uh, so yeah, that was that was a fun year. <laughs> would you have given the book a different title? If yes, what would it be? Um, no, I when I wrote the when I started writing it. I didn't have a name for a very long time. Um, the loop, uh, ref the name the loop refers to the prison that um, the main characters are in. And as soon as I named the prison the loop, I think I knew that was going to be the book's title. And I know a lot of times writers kind of come up with a title and the editors or the publishers will come up with um, a different name and it'll get changed somewhere along the line. But it just never happened. It was always the loop. There was never any other name suggested. And uh, yeah. I'm quite happy that it was the loop because yeah, it just always felt right. That was just the, the right name, in my opinion. Did you hide any secret messages in the book? Uh, <laughs> I actually did, yeah. Um, there's a Star Wars quote in each book um, that, uh, that people, I, I think if you're a really big fan of Star Wars, you might be able to spot the one in each book. Um, but other than that, I think, um, I suppose if you could think of theme as a hidden message I suppose there is a lot of kind of like uh hidden messages in there a lot of hints towards modern society and uh I think every writer maybe not purposefully at first you kind of focus on story and then when you go back and reread what you've written you might notice some themes uh in there that can relate to to the sort of modern day in the modern world um and I kind of noticed that in the loop there were things like class divides you know the rich and the poor and how people get different opportunities based on you know the situation you're born into uh so it's not so much as a hidden message like the star wars quotes i would say are hidden messages but um there's definitely themes in there that you might recognize if you look a little deeper beyond the story um you know things that i don't know i just kind of want to point out issues with the prison system issues with class divides and things like that. So in a way, there are hidden messages along with the Star Wars quotes. Last question. What was the hardest scene to write? Hardest scene to write? I don't remember any specific scene uh, being particularly difficult to write. Um, but there, I mean, there are days when I sit down to write and I can write 4,000 words and it comes so easily that it, it just seems like you know, a breeze, but there are days where I can sit down and I can't write five words. Uh, and there's never a particular scene because it can be an action scene that's very fast paced or it can be a dialogue scene between two characters that's very slow. And there seems to be no rhyme or reason why one day I'll be able to write loads of words and another day I can barely write any. Um, so I can't remember any specific scenes. I remember days and days of not being able to write very well at all, but specific scenes no, and it's funny because there can be, like I said, there can be days where it takes me hours to write just a few words and that can go on for, you know, weeks. And I think when I read back, it's going to be really clunky and not very good at all. Uh, but it, but it, it seems to not matter whether, you know, it takes a long time to write or it goes very quickly. Once you read it back, it seems to flow just as well. So, yeah, I'm usually, yeah, it's hard to explain. Um I don't remember any specific scenes that are difficult to write, but I remember specific days where the words didn't come easy at all. So, yeah. Day 31 in the block. When the harvest begins, all that exists is fear. It feels like an eternity before it ends. 
before the, the nanotech releases its grip on the parts of my brain that access terror and panic. Before my heart begins to slow and my muscles relax. Back in the loop, the prison I was in before the end of the world, the harvest lasted only six hours. And when it was done, we were left alone in our small soundproof cells. It seemed horrible at the time, but compared to the block, it was like heaven. The harvest tube stays in place while the water comes. It rushes in from the ceiling, smelling of acrid chemicals and bleach. As usual, I consider letting it drain me, pushing all the air out of my lungs at the moment the tube fills with water. I'm waiting to die so that I don't have to face another day of this hell. But I don't. The tube fills until I'm completely submerged. Time passes, 10 seconds, 12. And then the water drains away, throwing me to the floor once again. The air comes next, so hot that my skin feels like it's about to blister and burn. Once I'm dry, the tube lifts and retreats into the ceiling. The harvest is over and what comes next is just as terrible. I wait on the floor, my arms magnetized together behind my back by the implanted cobalt in my wrists. It's been 16 days since Happy, the all-powerful artificial intelligence that first ran the world and then destroyed it, tried to trick me into giving up the location of my friends. 